do. I do. <laughs> Come rain or shine. <clears throat> and then I'm like, if somebody walks by, say hello. Cause I'm Okay, take your time. <clears throat> I'm assuming I'm on. Huh? I'm assuming I'm on. Oh, okay. Is it on the sheet? There's no sheet. No sheet. Oh, boy. I think we're on, though. That's amazing. Yeah. Maybe we should wait a little bit. I don't know where where the the sheep person is. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Good morning, all you bright and shining faces. Hallelujah. Is there joy in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. All right. Let's shout out his praise then. Yeah. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. Lord, we just bless your holy name today. We thank you for the hope and the peace and the love and the joy of this day, the day that you have made. We rejoice in it. We glorify you. We worship you. We thank you. We pray a blessing over you as you bless us with all that you are and all that you have. We glorify you, Heavenly Father, and we thank you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yes. Has everybody said hello? <laughs> Have you greeted any, any, anybody, any, a few people here and a few people there? Sunday today, right? Next Sunday, can you believe it? It's Easter. We're not going to be in April yet, and it's already Easter. It's coming up quickly, really fast. I was just thinking about that. If uh, if you have any any friends or any family members that you know, a lot of times they might be more available or more willing to come to church on a holiday like that you know those who come on Christmas and Easter twice a year or once a year so if you think about it pray about it consider inviting someone to come with you joining with you maybe plan to you know get together with them afterward or maybe you already have plans like that I just thought I'd throw that out there for for consideration we already have people coming in from out of town, a family of six that's going to be staying with us, and they'll be here. It'll be good. We'll have a good time. 
So why don't we stand together this morning? And as you do, as you situate yourself, just raise up your hands in the air and praise him like you just don't care. <laughs> yeah, he's good, isn't he? Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that right now, huh?
Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory.
Thank you, Lord.
testimony this morning. He changed everything, turned everything around, pulled us out of the miry clay, out of the pit, set our feet on a rock. Yeah. Turned everything around.
Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the name of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Thank you, Father. Father, for healing, moving in our bodies, completely restoring as you've done so many times before. Thank you, Father. We're abiding in your healing anointing. Yes. Christ 
Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So worthy, Lord. just say his name. Whether just once or multiplied times. We speak Jesus over our families. Jesus over California. We speak Jesus over America. Yes. Because your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands above them all all thrones and dominion all powers and positions your name stands above them all as your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry
Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Take your communion bread this morning. Break it in two. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Say that with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Jesus, we can never forget. We will always remember, even through all eternity, the amazing work of atonement that you did for us. Father, we just want to say thank you for sending your Son. We praise and thanks, Lord. Let's take our bread, break it in two, and let's eat together. Jesus, you're good. You're good, God. We bless your name forever. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father the Prince of Peace. We remember on this Palm Sunday, <laughs> triumphant entry into Jerusalem, all setting the stage for what your, what your plan was, Father, to redeem us all, to set us free. And together we are just so thankful and honored. Just, just reach over and if you're near somebody, just touch them on the shoulder. We just bless each other this morning. We impart supernatural blessings upon our brothers and sisters in the name of Jesus, that they would just be overflowing with miracle working power. It's in them already. Let it flood out, not only into their households, but all around them at their workplaces, to those who they come in contact with. Let all of them see and know that we've been with God. We've been with you, Jesus. Your presence carries a residual upon us everywhere we go. The life of God, the love of God, and the grace of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. You can all be seated. Sit, sit, sit. Yeah. It's alive again. Yes. So now I got two ice cream cones. That's right. Okay. Well, let's see. I guess I will say hello and greet you and do all the uh, announcing things. Keep you apprised and aware. How many of you are still getting your weekly e-bulletin in your email? Is there anybody not getting it who wants it? I see a few hands. Um, I don't know what happens. Sometimes things go to spam or after a while it times out and or it starts bouncing for one reason or another, you know, follow the bouncing email. And uh, 
So if you would like that, we, we definitely want to get it to you. Just do me a favor on the back of an envelope today. Write down your email address clearly so I can read it and not miss any letters or numbers. And we'll update everything and make sure you're getting that. Cause we want you to, to know, be in the know, okay? Especially as we're making transition here uh, with the building and all. So, let's see. We've got some announcements. First of all, we welcome you all. Happy Palm Sunday. God is good. Today, Michelle is going to be ministering, actually, uh, this morning and next Sunday on Easter Sunday. Uh, and again, I'll just mention it because I was saying it as we were starting the service. If you know of anyone uh, that might be a perfect candidate to invite to church, why don't you send out an invitation or a text or something this week and invite them to come next Sunday. We're going to do a little kind of snacky thing as you come in next Sunday. Uh, so that'll be fun. And I know for a fact that there's going to be some folks here who haven't been here for a while. And uh, let's, let's fill these seats, you know. Um, you know, you can invite them and you can drag them. <laughs> You, I don't know, you know, just uh, see if you can get someone to come. It'll be fun. And uh, that'll be next Sunday, Easter Sunday. And we've got FaceTime with Jesus, March 29th, Friday at 10 a.m., which has been just wonderful. So come out for that. You can stay as long as you want. Uh, intercessory prayer, of course, every Thursday night. It's just been really good. Come for that, 6.30 p.m. And I guess that's it for the announcements today. So, Natalie, are you ready? We kind of surprised you last week, and you didn't have to come, and then this week it's, you're on. Good morning. It's offering time. Yay. <laughs> Yay, woo. God loves a cheerful giver, right? If you need an envelope for cash or electronic giving, just raise your hand and our usher will serve you. And even if you don't need it for cash or electronic giving, raise your hand for an envelope to put your email uh, address on the back. Um, if you have a check, make it out to New Song or NSWC. Um, if you want a text to give, you text New Song to 73256. And we always have our box in the back where you can put your offering. Um, today, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to encourage you. Um, to say that if you've been standing for a long time and you are standing on the word and you're giving and you're tithing and you're just not seeing what you wanted to see. And you're, he's just encouraging you to say, don't give up. Yeah. Stand firm. The Lord is good. He's always um, faithful to his promises. Yes. His promises never fail. Um, he's not one promise ever failed of all the promises he made to Abraham to Moses not one of them his word does not return void it always accomplishes what he pleases and purposes um, do not faint in the time of adversity for God is always with you he's promised to provide all your need he's promised to uh, give you the power to get wealth stand on those promises keep the faith keep the switch of faith turned on as I think Kenneth Hagin used to say. Um, is that Kenneth Hagin or Charles Katz? I think it was Kenneth. Anyway, um, yeah, so um, let me see. I said everything I was going to say. <laughs> um, yes, he's not unrighteous to pr forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his, his name and that you have ministered to the saints. When you give, you minister to the saints. And, and God is not slack in any of his promises and if you uh, reap, if you faint not, you will reap in due time. And I think that due time, Pastor, is Kairos. Is that correct? So you will reap in the proper the time, the time that God has appointed. And there is no no uh, shadow of turning with Him. He um, he's he, he's not a man that he he should lie. And no promise of His has ever been unfulfilled. So I just want to encourage you to stand fast, to do, and you say, well, I've done everything. I've done all I know to do. 
And I, I've, I've heard this preacher say, well, maybe you don't know all that there is to do. So just stay in the word, keep, keep looking, keep, keep staying in the word, and you, he will talk to you and show you anything. So thank you, Father, for your encouragement. Thank you, Lord, that you're always prompt to do it. You're always um, willing to give um, as we give. Um, and and you, you do not fail. You will not fail us. There's no, no uh, person that's ever gone begging for bread because, uh, as David said, I've been old and I'm young and I've never seen the, the righteous forsaken. So we thank you, Lord, that you do not forsake us as we believe you and we stand on your word, Father. We know that you are the provider. You will provide and you will not leave us lacking or hanging in, in um. So we just thank you, Lord, as we give our tithes and offerings this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Super quiet in here. Okay, I'm excited about the next today and next week. Um, as Dave already mentioned, and I know you already know, it's Palm Sunday, and um, you know Protestant churches in general, not I, not in general, non-denominational um, Protestant churches probably is more accurate. Don't necessarily make you know. We don't do always. We don't do the Stations of the Cross. We don't do you know these big Holy Week celebrations um, like Catholic churches and like I said, denom some denominational uh, Protestant churches do. But um, I was moved this year to to focus on not the traditional stuff. But um, you guys know that we. Uh, go every January pretty much up to Keith and Heidi Hershey's pastors conference and um, every year for the last several I can't I couldn't guess how many but um, since they've had their facility um, in the San Fernando Valley um, their son pastors the church there that's in their their facility is a former Lutheran church big brick beautiful building and um, they have a church there that their son Joshua pastors and so every year he on uh, Friday morning the pastors meet in kind of a more intimate setting and we always take communion together and Josh leads it and Josh is a modern day theo theologian in my opinion he's very studied and just but so grounded in the grace work of Jesus Christ there's not an ounce of religion in him but he knows history and he knows the word of God. So he shares so much. And so he had been doing, he did one for Christmas, a devotional. And I've shared little bits and pieces out of that over the last couple of years. But he did a new one about Easter, about the resurrection, the, you know, crucifixion. And it's called Gethsemane to Golgotha. And he gave, they gave this away this year in January. And it's a, it's a 30 uh, day 40, excuse me, 40 devotions on Christ's redemptive sufferings. And I didn't do it as a devotional. I just read the whole thing because um, I don't do so great with those day-by-day -day things because I jump around with what I do with the Lord in the morning. But um, I just devoured the whole thing. And um, I just, there were so many nuggets in here that I wanted to share. And uh, the last two Christmases, uh, because it was this year was was it this year was Christmas Eve was on a Sunday and the year before was Christmas morning um, we just gathered real intimately for a quick one hour service and we just read the Christmas story those of you that have joined us you remember we just read through it and then I kind of interjected some you know interesting things and facts and stuff but um, that's what we're gonna do for Easter we're gonna read the passion um, and we're gonna read the resurrection, obviously. 
Um, so today we're going to focus on the passion and the next Sunday, the resurrection. But the, the scripture's pretty short as far as how much the resurrect, you know, how much it covers. So through reading Josh's book, he has a whole appendix about the Shroud of Turin. And I don't know how educated you guys are on the Shroud. Um, I kind of had it in the back of my head. Yeah, I thought it had been debunked. I don't know, you know. I hadn't spent any time looking into it. But there's a lot of new information about the Shroud. And, um, and so next Sunday, we're going to talk about the Shroud. In, I'm not going to overload you guys, but because um, I could get in the weeds because it is cool stuff. But I'm going to try not to get too scientific because I am not a scientist. But we're going to share some stuff about um, the confirming evidence of the Shroud of Turin of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and the man Jesus Christ. So that's going to be interesting. Um, so today we're going to go as far as we can in the scripture. So basically we're going to be in the book of John and Kathy's going to follow along as we read um, just the account that John gives. And as you know, the um, other gospel writers as well, give their account. So there's going to be points where I diverge. I read the John, and then I'm going to bring in some of the other Gospels. And so it's going to be heavy Bible reading today. And so I just ask you guys to just hold on. You know, some, some people, you know, it gets a little, you know, I don't know, monotonous or whatever. I just ask us by the Spirit of God as I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would this would not just be words that I am reading, God, but they would be revelatory, they would be life-giving, that, they, that Lord, you, Holy Spirit, would paint the picture for us of what was going on, what might have been in, in your mind, Jesus, what, what you were feeling and experiencing. Lord, we focus so much as born-again Christians on the results of the cross and, and, and the benefits and the, the blessings that came because of our redemption, Lord. And I know we should. And we, and, we, and we spend the majority of our time there, Lord. But we are never to forget. That's why we do the communion, Lord. We're never to forget your sufferings and what you did for us. And, and so we remember that today in detail, Lord. So we ask you, and I ask you, Holy Spirit, to help it come forth in a way that people will receive and be blessed by it. And mostly, Lord, that you would be glorified in it in Jesus' name. Okay, so before we get into John, um, I'm just going to do some foundational stuff. I'm also going to talk about some of the fulfillments um, from the Old Testament. There's many. I think there's 150 or more uh, messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled, which is statistically impossible that one person could meet all those things. Uh, we're not going to talk about 150, but there's a couple that we will highlight. But before we get started, I just wanted to give a little foundation. Philippians 2, 7 to 11. And like I said, Kathy's only going to put up the John passages. So if you want to turn to these scriptures, you are more than welcome to, or you can just sit and listen to them. Uh, Philippians says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So a very familiar scripture to us, but just lays it out what his, what his ultimate destiny was, what his heart was of humility. And so this is just adding to our message. So one of those uh, messianic prophecies that is so well known that I just have to mention and will probably mention again next Sunday when we're talking about the details of the crucifixion is Isaiah 53 and uh, 1 through 12. And I'm going to read it. 
Who has believed our report and, to, and who whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and this is specifically talking about Christ, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, we, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And all we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. God, we just thank you. We know the, the verses about being wounded for our, you know, taking the stripes on his back, but I haven't read the entire chapter like that in a long time. There are so many messianic prophecies that are in that passage right there that he fulfilled okay so let's talk um the beginning of the story john doesn't um really talk about the triumphal entry dave already mentioned it so we're gonna read that part um before we hit john as well so this is luke um chapter 19 and it's starting in verse 28 And uh, let's do 29. And when it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his di disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus say, uh, shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosening the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they sent Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Verse 41, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, 
For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So I kept that last part in where he's prophesying over Jerusalem and basically saying, you know, knowing he's going to the cross, knowing he's going to pay the price, and knowing that the uh, majority, by and large, the Jewish leaders and um, their followers, except for the ones, obviously, the disciples, that crowd that came to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem, which it says was a multitude, but in comparison, he understood that he had been rejected by the Jews by and large. And so this is a declaration of what will now happen because they didn't receive him. And of course, God knew this was going to happen, that that whole system under the law has to be destroyed because this new thing is being born by Jesus dying on the cross and he knowing the Holy Spirit, he was going to send the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, uh, you city of Jerusalem did not receive, are not receiving me. So this is, and so he's prophesying what we know as the Roman attack on Jerusalem that happens in AD 70. So, you know, like 40 years later from the moment he's saying this, um, it happens and it destroys the temple. It stops temple worship as far as sacrifice and offering. It just stops. Now there's still the Jewish religion and they still worship, the, you know, but that center of uh, that kind of law and worship was completely stopped in AD 70. That temple has been Muslim for uh, centuries now. And so... Um, so this, is, I, I thought that was significant to include. And so uh, a, a fulfillment of this, what Jesus and his, his triumphal entry and what we just read is found in Zechariah. And Zechariah, the end of the book, the last few chapters, is like a mini passion uh, story. But we're not going to read all of that. We're just going to read two verses Zechariah 9, 9 and 10 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So incredible. Incredible the details that God wove all the way through those thousands of years to be fulfilled. Okay, now we're going to get into John's uh, passion. I made um, this little map. And I have, I think I have 20 copies. So if you're sitting next to someone, you might be able to um, share. Now this is, this is a map of the temple, the temple mount and the, the part of the city where, which takes place on the night of Jesus' trial and the early morning. And so... When you read it and it talks about he went here and stood trial and then he went to this guy and stood trial and he went to that and you're thinking, how did he do all this in such a short period of time? Um, this is how. That's why I gave you one. I apologize, it's a little blurry because I tried to blow it up as big as I could. But you'll see how close together these, pla these locations are. And so it's just steps away, like literally like 150 feet from the other building in, in some cases. And so it makes, it makes it more clear, I thought. So you can check it out. Okay, we're gonna be starting our reading in John chapter 18. The very first verse. One 
1 through 14 right here. Okay, has everybody got their maps? We'll get to it in just a second. Okay, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook, brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. I'm reading New King James, by the way. I forgot to say that. Um, verse 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. And I think in this, um, in this version in John, it doesn't talk about Judas kissing him. But we know from the other um, accounts that G Judas um, kisses Jesus at, at this point. Now, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back, back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? And we know also that Jesus reached up and healed that ear. That's told in the other uh, gospels as well. Verse 12 says, Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Okay, let's go through. I'm going to give you a little detail about this scene. Because it gets a little confusing with Annas and Caiaphas and all this stuff. So this is, this is what's going on. Let's see. It says, this is from the book. Well, our knowledge of Annas is not restricted to scripture. Some of the outside sources help shed light on the sad condition the Jews were in. For one, we know the priesthood since the time right before the Maccabees, nearly 200 years earlier, had been corrupted. Since this period, there was no longer a high priest descended from Zadok, nor was his appointment for a lifetime, nor was it hereditary, nor was he christened upon holding the office, all in defiance of God's word. And once Roman occupation arrived in 63 BC, things grew even worse. The high priest position began to be auctioned off by Roman governors, and many of the most powerful aristocratic families bid against each other. From 37 BC until the fall of the temple in AD 70, there were 28 high priests from four Jewish families. These families would all intermarry to consolidate their power, and the most prominent family during this period was the family of Annas. Annas officially held the position of the high priesthood for nine years from AD 6 to 15. Josephus says he was, quote, a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders and above all the rest of the Jews. And he says Annas, quote, had servants who were very wicked, who took away the tithes that belonged to the priests by violence and did not refrain from beating such as would not give these tithes to them. Oh boy. The Jewish Talmud agrees with this portrait of An Annas. It refers to the temple market at the time of Jesus as the, quote, bazaars 
of the sons of Annas. So remember Jesus cleansing the temple, right? This detail is interesting. I just preempted myself because it sheds light on the temple cleansing narratives at the beginning and end of Jesus's ministry. It was most likely Annas's family, foremost being his five sons, who were profiting off of the money-changing booths and sacrificial sales. Jesus, them, Jesus bro, uh, drove them out and overturned their tables. I'm sure Annas received an earful about these incidents and was more incensed than anyone as his family profited greatly for their unjust exchange rates. Though Annas was only high priest for nine years, his power and influence lasted much longer for five of his sons and a stepson would also hold the high priesthood, Caiaphas being that stepson. Though Annas wasn't considered the official high priest by Rome, he is clearly presented in scripture as being a high priest and calling the shots. The fact that Jesus was brought to the 60-year-old Annas before being led to the younger Caiaphas shows Annas was still very powerful and was likely pulling many of the strings that night and clearly had a grudge against Jesus because of what he did to his changing tables in the temple. Okay, so you keep an eye on that map as we go through um, the next few verses. Um, so we're going to be 15 to 27 now. And Simon Peter, following Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that Jesus, disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. We know that's John. He never names himself when he's talking about himself. Verse 16, but Peter, Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. No, now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood, be, uh, stood there for it was cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So we know, obviously, from the other gospel accounts that Jesus told Peter, you're gonna deny me three times before the roast, rooster crows. And that was not included in John's narrative. So that's what we're building up to right here, as well as other things. Okay, so he's gone in to the courtyard, to Annas's courtyard. So if you're looking on your map, um, he's in, um, I think it's in the house of Caiaphas where Annas is. There, it's a big house. I don't have the time to read the details of it, but it's described in the book. But um, so he's, he's in that courtyard Right now, and then verse 19 says, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but it, if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So here he goes. Now Annas, they're going, now you're going to the actual high priest. Okay, keep going a couple more verses. Now, Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. He's at that fire in the courtyard. Therefore, they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the uh, servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again and immediately a rooster crowed. So let me give you um, some of those details that were not ca uh, caught by John. So Mark 14, 53 to 65 says this about that same encounter. And they led Jesus away to the high priest and with them were assembled all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. 
Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Two or three witnesses it takes. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and with three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palm of their hands. Yeah, and then in other places it says they were striking him and say, prophesy, tell us who's hitting you, you know, kind of thing. They're mocking him. Okay, next page of information. Finally, two false witnesses came forward that agreed enough to pass the test in the eyes of the council. They accused Jesus of saying, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Matthew and Mark seem to be in slight tension on how much these witnesses even agreed. But the tension can be relaxed when we realize that this was as close to two agreeing witnesses that the council could find. Not perfect, but close enough for these men hell-bent on getting a charge to stick to Jesus before morning arrived. While Jesus did have a lot to say about the destruction of the temple in his Olivet Discourse, there is never a statement like the one the false witnesses report. Even in his metaphorical statement about the temple, when Jesus was speaking about his own body, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He did not say he would destroy it like the false witnesses maintained. Neither did he say, I will build another. Regardless, Caiaphas, who was desperate at this point, uh, late point in the trial, seized on this accusation. He said to Jesus, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? And Jesus' response was silence. Uh, and so uh, another fulfillment of that passage is Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Zechariah 13 also quotes, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That for sure came true. And then in Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus predicts the, the um, denial of Peter and the rest of him. He says, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, which we just read out of Zechariah, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So this is all just coming together to weave this story that God knew. Okay, verses 28 to 40 in John. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. I just have to stop here because it just struck me. They are, they are illegally completely illegally against the law of Moses, condemning this man to death. And they need to get the Romans to do it because they can't. But when they go to Pilate, this is the praetorium is where Pilate is, they won't go in his house because he's not Jewish. They won't break the law and go in his house. And I just had to say, Hypocrite. I just had to 
point that out because it disgusted me. The whole thing is disgusting, obviously. But strain a gnat and swallow, you know, the camel or whatever that passage is. Verse 29, Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. They knew it. Keep going. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this, this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to this truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? He's being like Roman, like kind of mocking. He doesn't, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That's the, that's the origin of wokeness for sure. Right. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him. I can't kill this guy. He's not doing anything wrong. Verse 39, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So that's in Pilate's uh, court where um, they are meeting with uh, uh, Pilate. Um, and I'm trying to remember how it works on the map. I think it's not, it's Palace of Herod Antipas, and then there's, I can't remember which one it is. I'm sorry, you guys, I should have written my notes on there, but we got to keep going. Um, so let me read this, page 67, about this thing of Barabbas. Barabbas. Um, okay, so Barabbas was in prison and sentenced to death for the same, very same crime the chief priests were trying to pin on Jesus. Jesus suffered as the central lestai between two other lestives, basically um, zealots. They're religious zealots and they're violent because of their religious beliefs. He suffered as the chief sinner in place of the real chief sinner in that Jerusalem prison. The name Barabbas is an Aramaic now hang on here with me. Aramaic patronymic name of one's father, similar to Barnabas, Bartholomew, or Bartimaeus. Bar is Hebrew for son of. Barabbas means son of Abba. Abba was a popular Hebrew first name for men during the time of Jew Jesus. Sometimes in scripture, one's pray no, pray no men, personal name, is combined with their patronymic for instance, Peter is called Simon Bar-Jonah by Jesus. Was Barabbas Pranomen preserved? Well, many scholars believe the original reading of Matthew and best manuscripts do preserve his name. So the NIV, NRSV, and NET all say his name was Jesus Barabbas. Thus, standing before Pilate were two men named Jesus Bar-Abba. For the Father in heaven had twice thundered from heaven about Jesus. This is my beloved son. The eternal, so Abba means father, we know that. The eternal son of the father who came down from heaven as the only begotten son of God takes the place of a son of the father who was a murderer on death row. The truth is we are all Barabbas. All of humanity is on death row. The wages of sin is death. 
All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but on Passover, a spotless lamb of God has taken our place. On this lamb was placed the sin of the whole world. What Jesus Barabbas needed to do was not rejoice at the pardon of Pilate, but rejoice rather that he had been pardoned by the Heavenly Father through the merit of the substitute who was about to die the death he deserved. If Jesus Barabbas received that pardon, he would no longer have simply been the son of Abba, but he would have been the adopted son of the almighty Heavenly Abba. He would have passed from spiritual death into spiritual life. Wild, right? So good. Okay, John, starting in chapter 19. You guys hanging in there? Okay. All right, we're going. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. So he was just planning to scourge him and give him back. He was not planning to kill him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. He's pointing his finger straight at them. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard this saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, again, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, I, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. I think that's as far as I need to go right now. And Luke, let's just read what Luke says about, um, he then goes, and it doesn't say in John, that he then goes to to, uh, Herod. When Pilate heard of Galilee, um, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned it with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. So Herod is a Jewish ruler over that area. And Pilate is the Roman, right? So they were at odds, but they became... Do you see the political inner workings that are happening? The chief priests and the rulers saying, we have no king but Caesar. I mean, that's, a, that's blasphemy right there. So in Matthew 27, it gives us more insight about what happens um, when Jesus comes back from Herod. It says in verse 22, Pilate said to them, 
What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all to said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, what, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And then when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. They just accepted the curse right there. They were so, I, it's just the religious spirit is so out of control. Um, I don't have time to read it, but we know in this interaction back and forth with Pilate, we know his wife was coming in and saying, I've had a dream. You should not do this. She's warning him. So all that is happening. And of course we know that he needed, he had to be crucified. So this was going to happen whether Pilate was, you know, in agreement or not. But it's just, you know, all that. I just don't have time to go to every bit of, I'd have to read all four gospels to you, that whole section. So we're just going to stick right here. Okay. So starting in verse 17, um, it's, the title is the king on the cross. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but, but say, quote, he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. <laughs> he knew he was the king of the Jews. Yeah, right. 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam woven from the top in one piece they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Then Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, which we know is John, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine and, uh, was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with sour wine, putting it on hyssop and putting it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. They don't make it, it doesn't, it wasn't made super clear. They don't give a lot of details about the actual crucifixion, but it was a common thing during Roman times. So there's a lot of detail about crucifixion, but there are scriptures, um, let me see, where it talks about him um, being naked, you know, and when we see pictures and art and on a crucifix, say in a Catholic church, he's always got that little loincloth on, right? <coughs> but that's not accurate. It is almost certain he hung on that accursed tree completely naked. Nakedness was one aspect of shame that accompanied the cross. The early church depictions of Jesus, even some dating back to the late first or second century on gemstones, all depict Christ naked. And I believe he was uh, uh, completely naked during the scourging as well. The nakedness of Jesus, because you'll see on the shroud, there's, marks on all all over him front and back 
Um, the nakedness of Jesus seems to be a consensus of the church fathers as well. One mid-century Christian bishop from Turkey, Melito of Sardis, had this to say about Christ's passion. Quote, he who hung the earth in its place hangs there. He who fixed the heavens is fixed there. He who made all things fast is made fast upon the tree. The master has been insulted. God has been murdered. Oh, strange murder, strange crime. The master has been treated in unseemly fashion, his body naked and not even deemed worthy of a covering, that his nakedness might not be seen. Therefore, the lights turned away and the day darkened that it might hide him who was stripped upon the cross. The medieval priest, John Toller, wrote, See how the king of glory who clothed and covered all things, the heaven with clouds, the tree with leaves, the earth with grass and flowers, is himself stripped of all clothing, even to the skin. Another medieval writer, Thomas Akempis, thought about upon Christ's nakedness, nakedness like this. As the first Adam, when placed in paradise, walked before his fall in naked liberty, so didst thou in like manner ascend the cross naked to regain the lost home of peace. So powerful. Just a little detail from Luke of this same happening. Verse 26 of chapter 23 says, Now as they led him away, they led, laid hold of a certain man, Simon of, uh, Simon of Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And indeed, for the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There, was, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering the sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, Save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let me just read a little bit. Luther, Martin Luther, said of this passage, he wants us to rejoice, to glorify God, to thank him for his mercy, to praise, to extol, and to confess him, because his going to the cross has brought to us the grace of God, freed us from sin and death, and made us God's dear children. And talking about the shame and the nakedness and all that stuff, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. A little more detail. I, did, I read this part already about his nakedness. I'm going to go to um, Mark. Somehow I got it out of order. Mark 15 says, uh, Now when the sixth hour had come, 
There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, these Hebrew words I can't pronounce, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A note, um, I don't know if I'm gonna read it. Um, that's like the first time Jesus ever called the Father God, never, not referred to him as Father because he was, in, he was taking our place. Some of those who stood by and when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. That someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. And a few more um, points and we'll be done. Um, so from the sixth hour to the ninth hour is um, 9, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So it goes, he was on the cross for six hours. Um, some people, the reason they came and broke the bones, they were, you know, it was Passover. So they were trying to get these, they had to get these guys down before sundown on, on Friday because of the Jewish holiday. So that's why they, they broke the bones to, to quicken their death. But Jesus died so fast. But Jesus' beating was so horrendous that, you know, plus God wasn't going to leave them up there because they can stay for days um, in, in crucifixion. Some can. In Matthew 27, 50 to 54 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So that's cr like huge signs. It says they started walking around once Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. Psalm 22 is known as a messianic psalm and it fulfills, it is fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Verse seven says, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now down to 16, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Zechariah 12.10 is another one that was fulfilled. It says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced, Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Obviously, he's talking about the Jews in general. This last excerpt from the book. How does the piercing of Christ's side tie into Scripture's history? I didn't get there yet. Um, I should probably read John first. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced, which I just read. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. 
He came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Because it's now um, Friday, and you know Saturday is a Sabbath day, so they can't do anything on Saturday. Okay, how does the piercing of Christ's side tie into Scripture's history? In the beginning, Adam was put in a deep sleep in a garden. His side was opened, and a bride was formed from his side, whom he called woman upon rising. The last Adam was put in a deep sleep on the cross. His side was open, he was placed in a garden, and he called his new creation bride, woman, upon rising. Also, after being redeemed by the Passover, Passover lambs, the Israelites were without water in the wilderness. God told Mo Moses, I am going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and the people will drink. Paul says, that rock was Christ. As the divine presence was struck with the rod of judgment, gracious water poured forth to receive the dying people. Thank you, Lord. Let's take communion, please. Oh, thank you. I got a leaky nose today. Well, since you're up, Tom, don't sit down. <laughs> Lead your side, come up and get your communion element. <laughs> the center, would you like to come up? You already have your stitches? Yeah. Ready to pray? Jesus, today more than ever, maybe not ever, but especially today, as we've read the story and the accounting of what you suffered, what you were saying, what they were saying about you, the seeing so clearly depicted the motives of the chief priests and scribes and Pharisees' hearts and the hatred with which they hated you. And that really breaks my heart, Lord, is that how cold and hardened their hearts were toward not just you, but Father. They didn't have a clue. I think there's a scripture that says they didn't know the hour of their visitation. They had no idea 
But God, then knowing the new covenant and what it says, that really they were hardened, almost like, like in the times of the uh, Egyptian captivity with Pharaoh. They had to be hardened so that you would go and pay the price. And ultimately, Lord, so that we, the Gentiles, would come in. We are in that hour, Lord, of the time of the Gentiles that you have given this wide open time and space for everyone of every generation that will accept you as their lamb that was slain, accept you as their sacrifice for sin, that heaven would be populated of every tongue and every tribe and every people, rich and poor, old and young, every nation under heaven. You are that loving Father. And Jesus, so willing to do what you did for us. And so with this little cup of juice and wine, we choose to remember, we choose to allow you, Holy Spirit, to impress upon us what it took what you suffered, what you paid for us, and to also know, Lord, that we will never pay that price, that you never wanted us to pay that price. And so I thank you, Jesus, and also just thinking about there are people who have given their lives for you that have been martyred for their faith, Jesus. I don't know how many have been crucified as you were, but many who have given their lives. So we just are in awe and wonder and appreciation of those men and women over the last two centuries that have not given up on you, Lord, but seen their eternal destiny far beyond their temporal. And so, Lord, as they are our examples and as you gave us the ability, Lord, May we be found faithful in this hour when life is so easy, God. May we choose you over and over again to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to give our life fully to you every day, God, whatever that looks like, knowing that you have given us the ability to do it. And so we thank you and praise you for it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Why don't we stand and just give him our worship just for a second. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for us understanding the shame and the ridicule and the persecution that came, Lord. Even on the early church after you died and were resurrected. We worship you, Jesus, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name. We worship you this holy week, Lord. And remember all these things. We thank you, Father, that you're, we hear your voice. We can commune with you. It's not a religious routine. It's not just attending services or giving up stuff for Lent or you know, the things that some people do. And some of it might be led by you, Lord, but it's not in the doing, it's in the understanding. It's in the, it's in the re revelation of, for each of us. So we ask you, Lord, this week for revelation of these passages that we read today. Expand it, Lord, that we would go into the other gospels and devour all that, you, all that happened in those three or four days, God. We just love you so much. We honor you. We thank you for this day and the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bill and Carla will be up here to pray with anybody that needs that. I'm happily, happy to do it. Um, we just release you guys today. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And we look forward so much to next Sunday celebrating the resurrection.